so that theoretically if we will give um, activated protein C, we should uh, increase the coagulation cascade in your patient's sepsis. So the, the giving of um, activated protein C in patients with septic shock is theoretically sound. No, so that in the previous guideline, they actually uh, recommended giving um, activated human protein C in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. But in the recent recommendation, they gave it a weak recommendation, grade 2 B. So activated uh, protein C may, do, may be used in patients with sepsis-induced organ dysfunction with higher risk of death. So for high risk of death, a patch score of more than 25, then you can give your activated protein C. And patients with severe sepsis and low risk of death should not receive activated protein C. And that's a strong recommendation. This slide will show you the, the result of that study uh, where they base the recommendation of giving your activated protein C. So this will show you that patients who are given your activated protein C has lesser mortality compared to your placebo. So that's uh, their basis of giving the recommendation. But the recent study where it was uh, stopped early because of uh, fertility. So they found that there is actually no uh, advantage in giving your activated protein C uh, in patients with severe septic shock. So they do not recommend it. Another uh, diagram showing that uh, there is a decrease in mortality in patients given your activated protein C, especially to those with more than one multi organ failure. So the more organs that uh, fails, the more advantageous it is if we give activated proteins in this study. So blood products. If you have already stabilized the patient, you have, eat, uh, you have done your um, fluid challenge, and then you see that the patient is uh, anemic, you may opt to give red blood cell if the hemoglobin is below 7 grams per year. So your target should be between 7 to 9 only. You don't go beyond 9 as your target. And it is not recommended to use erythropoietin as a treatment for anemia in sepsis. Unless you use it for your uh, treatment of anemia in chronic renal patients. And it is not recommended you know, to use fresh frozen plasma to correct clotting abnormalities unless there is uh, bleeding and there is a plant invasive uh, procedure. Because studies have shown, uh, actually there, is, there are no studies that proves that giving fresh frozen plasma in those patients who have population abnormalities are, will really benefit the patient. But uh, there are professional um, groups that recommends giving your fresh frozen plasma so they recommend it only in patients with uh, bleeding and those who will have uh, invasive surgical procedures. Otherwise, if there is none, then you don't give your fresh frozen plasma. This will just show you that the survival in patients who are given liberal transfusion strategy is actually lower compared to your patients given restrictive transmission strategy. That's why they recommend only you aim between 7 to 9. So it's not re uh, recommended to use antihydrogen therapy. No, antihydrogen therapy will also uh, decrease your coagulation uh, cascade, but studies using this did not show any benefit. So they do not recommend it. And you administer platelet in patients with sepsis when the count is less than 5,000, regardless of bleeding. And then if the platelet count is between 5 to 30,000 and there is significant risk of bleeding, then you may opt to give your platelet transition. And um, if the count is more than 50,000 and there is a surgical procedure plan, then you have to transmit your platelet to the patient. Mechanical ventilation. This is actually the third of the terminology, so I will just breeze through it. No, so they recommend a target of tidal volume of 6, uh, 6 ml per kilogram per minute. 
And I will show you in the next slide the, uh, the comparison of uh, survival of patients uh, given 6 ml kilogram of weight tidal volume of the drug. So, you also have to target initial, initial upper limit the two pressure. If you understand this, the two technologies understand it. Less than 30 cm water. And they gave that a strong recommendation. And you allow arterial carbon dioxide to increase above normal level, or your permissive hypercapnia, so that um, your cardiac output will uh, increase. And positive and expiratory pressure should be set to avoid collapse um, at end expiratory phase um, of your respiration. And consider prone position for ARDS required in this level of FIO2 or the 2 pressure. I don't think this is possible in our in our setting, no? but they they have shown in some studies that uh, they can decrease the level of inspired oxygen when they put the patient in prone position. So this is the slide that will show you that the mortality in patients who are given 12 and up per kilo vital volume is higher compared to those patients who are given 6 and up per kilo. So this is the result of that uh, prone positioning study. You know, 70 percent of prone patients improve oxygenation, and 70 percent of response was seen within an hour. And the 10 day mortality rate in quartile with the lowest uh, ratio of your arterial oxygen and expired oxygen, there is a lesser mortality in your prone patients compared to your supine patients. But all in all. The survival actually is almost the same. So it's recommended to maintain patient in semi-recumbent position at 45 degrees. to set the bed 45 degrees. And non-invasive ventilation should be considered in minority of acute lung injury and ARDS patients with mild to moderate hypoxemia. So if the patient is awake, the patient can expectorate and can protect the airways and can opt to do non-invasive ventilation, just nasal cannula or mask. And you, they recommend the use of breathing protocol and spontaneous breath, breathing test regularly. Because they have shown, uh, it was shown in different studies that if you use breathing protocol and SVT, the duration of mechanical ventilation is shortened. 